Hello, I'm John Boatwright. I'm now retired as the Emeritus Professor of Business Ethics at Loyola University, uh, Chicago, where I held the Baumhardt Chair in Business Ethics. And could you explain who Father Baumhardt is? Father Baumhart was the president of Loyola University uh, up until the time before I came uh, and has the distinction of being one of the founders of business ethics. Uh, he went to the business school at uh, Harvard. I wanted to write something on business ethics where he apparently met great uh, resistance. But he did a study on what businessmen, uh, businessmen mind that, uh, think. And so that was a an article in the Harvard Business Review and then was developed into a book. So that book is one of the uh, first uh, ones in business ethics. 1961. 1961. Yeah. Good, I just thought right. we were here, we might, I forgot about him. So, so uh, I know you graduated from the University of, I mean, the University of Chicago, and I, but I've never known, what did you study there? Oh, well, that was my PhD program in, uh, ethics. This, of course, was before there was any field of uh, business ethics. I had no idea that I would one day enter that um, field. Uh, but I did my specialization in um, ethical theory. Uh, and uh, from there went uh, to my first job at uh, John Carroll University in Cleveland in a philosophy department where I was teaching a wide variety of courses, including courses in uh, ethical theory. But at that time, we were also teaching courses in uh, applied ethics, contemporary moral problems, the courses were usually called, where we took up a variety of problems, um, abortion, euthanasia, uh, discrimination, and the like. And so from that uh, developed an interest in um, business ethics. And I can't actually recall whether I suggested that I teach such a course or I was asked if I would teach such a course. But in one way or another, I began teaching a course in uh, business ethics. And I discovered I liked it, and I found it uh, very interesting. And one thing led to another, and before long, I was teaching uh, only uh, business ethics. And at the time, uh, we had a very supportive uh, business school and Dean Frank Navertil. And so this course became a required course in the uh, business school. So even though I was in a philosophy department, uh, I worked closely with people in the business school and uh, found a great uh, home uh, in that business school. And, and then how did that, that beginning and teaching business ethics lead to your, your research? And, and tell us about your research and your focus. Well, first of all, I began uh, doing topics in business ethics which lent themselves to standard philosophical approaches, which had already been um, investigated and the like. Um, and I, in the course, I used um, some of the standard business uh, ethics course textbooks at the time and was rather dissatisfied with them. So I decided, hey, I, I can do better than this. <laughs> so I decided that I would uh, write a textbook in business ethics, uh, which I did, which is now in um, an eighth edition. So like most people in the field, uh, early people in the field, uh, I learned business ethics, the, the business part of business ethics, uh, on my own as a, as a process of self-education. Uh, but out of that, you also developed a particular mm -hmm. expertise. Um, would you say that? I, I did, not, did not set out to, to become an expert in any particular field. Uh, what I would do is I would pose questions that I found very interesting, especially in areas I didn't know very much about. So I think I viewed almost every research project as, a, as an opportunity for self-education. Uh, so instead of picking topics uh, where I, I felt I knew something, I picked topics where I knew I didn't know uh, much at all just so that would force me to uh, expand my horizons and delve into those uh, fields. That's going to change minds. Okay. So, so moving kind of forward and then going backward, I would say, what, are, what, what have been your contributions to the field? 
Well, I have to break that down into two parts. One is the organizational part, and the other is the academic um, portion. So in terms of organization, uh, I, because of my work in business ethics, I was asked to serve on the board. And so I became a board member and ultimately president, serving in, I believe, 1998, I, the academic year 1997-98, as president of the uh, society. But after that, I uh, became the executive director of the society, which is where, in truth, the real work is done. One feature of the administration of the society is that uh, much of the work falls to the executive director. So for five years between 19, or pardon me, between 20, 000, 2000 and 2004, I served as executive director of the society. I would divide the history of the society into sort of three phases. Uh, it's sort of childhood, it's adolescence, and it's adulthood. <laughs> So the society originated in the late 70s, essentially as a special interest section of the uh, American Philosophical Association. And so we met with the uh, APA and had one session. And as I recall, dues were about $5, which covered the cost of a newsletter, which was mimeographed and sent to all um, members. Um, and it was a very informal uh, organization. So when I became executive director in uh, 2000, I discovered, for example, that I couldn't open a bank account because we weren't uh, incorporated. We apparently had some status in uh, Pennsylvania where Ron Duska had previously served as executive director. But I couldn't open a bank account until we were formally incorporated. And so I consulted uh, some lawyers and and successfully incorporated the society as a nonprofit in the state of uh, Illinois. Uh, that was the simple part uh, because previously we had been a 50C3 organization, but uh, with the new incorporation, the IRS regarded us as a new organization. So I also had to go through the whole process again of uh, uh, getting 501C3 uh, status. And at that time, the executive director. Uh, uh, wrote, developed contracts for annual meetings, negotiated with hotels. I handled registration for the meetings, uh, printed up the name tags, did the program book, and uh, so on. So I feel that my main accomplishment was to take the society from a very informal uh, organization to a much more formal organization. But since that time, my successors, who uh, manage the society very well, have uh, outsourced many of these uh, functions. And so we now have a fully adult, so to speak, uh, academic uh, organization. So on the other, uh, as far as uh, research is concerned. Could I just interrupt yeah. one second? Back to the first. Yeah. The, you might also talk that you really shaped up the finances. I mean, they were a yeah. little bit helter <clears throat> Much as I love Ron Duster. Well, before I took over, there really wasn't that much uh, revenue. <laughs> yeah. But when the uh, journal was founded in 1990, uh, we now had much more uh, revenue. And uh, the, our publisher was able to handle registrations and uh, 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 membership and the like. Uh, but it was simply, we now had more revenue as a result of the uh, journal. And so... I, our, uh, our balance sheet uh, greatly increased during that period of uh, time. And I've argued that it's very important to have a lot of money because we make big financial commitments, especially for the uh, annual meeting. And so I've been informed by the most recent treasurer that we are still in a very healthy financial uh, state. Now, in terms of uh, academics, um, I feel one of my main accomplishments has been to, sh to try to shift the focus of business ethics from, so to speak, the person to the to institutions. In my presidential address, uh, I used essentially to get some things off my chest. But one thing I argued was that uh, in business ethics, uh, we were placing too much emphasis on the role of the individual, especially the manager. 
and not enough emphasis upon uh, markets and, and uh, the institutions of uh, capitalism. So I developed what I called the, um, uh, the manager model and the market model. <laughs> and we should pay attention, of course, to both. But I think that the focus of business ethics should be much more on, again, markets and uh, institutions. As part of that, um, I, have not, I have not brought any particular theory, theory to bear. I didn't feel that I had to be a theorist of one kind or another and apply that to business ethics uh, problems. But rather, I posed problems and looked around for the best uh, resources for answering those uh, questions. But I found much of the um, opportunity in um, uh, economics. And I was greatly inspired by the law and economics uh, movement, in which uh, the movement in legal theory in which economics is used for analysis of um, legal matters. And so I tried to apply the same to business ethics, trying to use uh, economics as a way to look at, frame, and answer uh, ethical um, issues. And I've also been inspired by what's called the new institutional economics. In classical economics, the firm is treated as sort of a market actor, uh, which simply buys and sells uh, uh, um, inputs and outputs. Uh, and so the new institutional economics sort of opens up the black box of the corporation and uses economic analysis to look inside the um, uh, uh, firm. So. Um, uh, again, I find great inspiration in, the, again, the new institutional uh, economics. And you have a book on that. Well, um, uh, aside from my textbook, my other main publication is the book uh, Ethics in Finance, which is now in a third edition. And there's a story behind that. Uh, when uh, Mike Hoffman and Bill Frederick were developing their, their book series, Foundations of Business Ethics. Uh, they asked for my advice, and so I offered it. And so as a result, they offered me uh, first dibs on a book topic and asked me what I would like to do. I said, well, I'll, I'll do finance. Again, not because I knew a whole lot about finance. In fact, I knew very little. But again, like my other research topics, it was a field that I wanted to um, look into. So again, I'm entirely self-trained in finance. Uh, but what I discovered is that you don't need to have a PhD in finance to do finance uh, ethics. Um, it's, 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 not, it's essential, though, that you understand the, the operation of finance and financial uh, institutions. Uh, for example, um, I know what the Black-Scholes option pricing model is. I couldn't actually apply it. Uh, in fact, I'd probably lose a firm a large amount of money if I were to, tra to trade uh, options. But at least I know what, what uh, the model is, how it works, and why it is um, important. So in such fields, uh, again, one doesn't need to know everything. <laughs> but uh, it, it is a field in which I moved simply because I wanted to know more about it and eventually write a book uh, on it. So that's sort of how I got into um, finance. But your book is now in the second edition, am I correct? It's in the third edition. Third? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Great. Well, do you want to say that? that okay. The book is and the book is now in a uh, third edition. Which is terrific. Great. And so how do you see, or do you have yeah. any other comments about your own research and your own contributions? Hmm. I probably said what I want to say. So. You did receive a distinguished award for your research from the Society. Right. So I've received uh, two awards from the Society for Business Ethics. Uh, one of the few people uh, to receive both the award for service and for uh, academic uh, achievement. How do you see the field? Well, let me ask you this other, mm -hmm. sort of in the middle of the question. What, what aspects of your career are you most proud? Um, well, I, I'm proud of the textbooks that I have written because I think the textbook writing is a very important part of uh, a contribution to any field. Mm -hmm. 
especially a field like business ethics, which uh, has been in the process of formation. So in writing a, a best-selling uh, textbook, one has the opportunity to essentially define the field, to identify the important problems, to shape uh, the ways in which these are approached, and to some degree the position taken on these uh, issues. Uh, and uh, with uh, my work in uh, finance ethics, uh, I feel I was really the first in the business ethics field to deal with these uh, issues. And I've been very proud of the way in which uh, uh, p other people have followed up so that now uh, finance is a much more studied area of business ethics. Can I ask you, who, who, who are the people you, you, who have inspired you alongside Um, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I've uh, focused a great deal on uh, uh, corporate governance. Um, the, uh, the way in which I've gotten into corporate governance is within business ethics. Uh, stakeholder theory has been a very prominent, uh, played a very prominent uh, role. And I'm probably identified as a person who uh, is opposed to stakeholder theory. Uh, that's a little exaggeration because I don't reject uh, stakeholder theory, uh, but I am critical of certain aspects of it. In particular, when stakeholder theory was first developed, uh, there was strong emphasis on corporate governance. And so I've asked people in stakeholder theory, what would you change in corporate governance to make our corporations uh, enable stakeholder management? And by and large, they have not been able to come up with an answer. <laughs> So I have, uh, in my writings, been a strong supporter of uh, shareholder primacy and the view of uh, firm shareholder control of uh, corporations. And my position has been that we don't really understand what the argument is. And if we understand the argument, then it turns out that shareholders aren't really that uh, important. But as a principle of corporate governance, shareholder primacy, I believe, is well uh, supported. I sort of joke with my students. Um, uh, we have this phrase that the corporation should be operated for the benefit of shareholders, to make profits for shareholders. I go, well, that, that's, that's not, strictly speaking, true. The first obligation of management is to remain solvent. And if the firm remains solvent, then they will pay uh, sh uh, workers' wages, maybe good wages. They will pay suppliers. They will provide good products to consumers and so on. So in short, before we even get to the point of profits, the operation of the corporation should benefit uh, all these other uh, groups. So it, once the firm uh, remains solvent, then all these other groups are taken care of and only the shareholders uh, remain. And so in my work, I've tried to uh, sort of show the relation between a, a, sta a stockholder and a stakeholder view of the uh, uh, corporation I think one of the best things I've ever written was the book on, uh, on contractors as uh, stakeholders, where I tried to um, sort of map out where the two theories uh, stand and where they uh, differ. And the main point on which I think they differ is that um, uh, stakeholder view, uh, managing uh, from a stakeholder perspective, to be the responsibility of uh, management. And so in another article, um, uh, what, what's, what's wrong and what's right with stakeholder, stakeholder management, I present what I call the stakeholder fallacy, which is the corporation should operate for the benefit of all stakeholder groups. Therefore, this is the responsibility of management. Well, I think the first is absolutely true. <laughs> if the corporation is not benefiting all the groups that uh, participate, then something is wrong and we need to uh, correct it. Um, uh, but in order to get to the conclusion, therefore this is the job of management, we need some other premise, which again may, somehow makes this, making sure that the corporation benefits everyone, somehow the responsibility of managers. And I view managers as uh, highly constrained and very limited in what they can uh, do. And it's really the, the, the markets themselves and the design of institutions which determine, indeed, whether the corporation will operate in the interest of all of these uh, other groups. In, in, the, in the context, then, of regulation and oversight, does your work, then, 
transcend into the into the political arena in the United States? Uh, quite definitely, <clears throat> in the sense that uh, um, markets operate within a, a political, social, uh, uh, ethical uh, uh, framework. And so when I say, so I sort of said, uh, really making sure that the corporation operates in the, for the benefit of all groups is really the job of, well, everyone and no one. <laughs> so where I disagree with stakeholder theory is sort of making this the sole responsibility of uh, management. It's a responsibility for all of us uh, in our role as uh, citizens to make sure that the corporation does work in this, um, this way. And do you think that the, the discipline has kept up with developments enough like it's in your area, high frequency trading, for instance, is so beyond Ken mm -hmm. Moses? Yeah. Uh, have we the tools and the, the means and the analytical abilities to keep up with modern future developments? Well, it's very much a challenge to do so. In some areas, especially finance, I believe that the relevant regulatory agencies, uh, and particularly the Federal Reserve, say the Federal Reserve Bank in their research and the SEC and the like, are very much on top of these uh, issues. And so in writing about finance ethics, I've drawn very heavily upon these other uh, sources. In other areas, especially as they affect uh, politics, for example, the whole issue of uh, inequality uh, and uh, the um, way in which wages have not kept pace with uh, productivity, that's very much a political problem which our political system has not been able to uh, uh, grapple with. And is that a problem that business ethicists can handle, or is it a, too much of a public policy issue? Or should we be doing public policy? I guess I'll phrase that question. Well, I would say it's an issue for everyone. So I would say that there is a role for uh, scholarly work in business ethics to uh, help contribute toward a solution. But it's such a big problem <laughs> and such a multifaceted problem that I think that the contribution that business ethics can make is relatively small. But I think the contribution that any one group can make is, again, relatively small. So what we need is for everyone to work on these kinds of problems. So how do you see business ethics is in, say, 10 or 20 years from now. Will it be flourishing? Will it, will it disappear? Will it have merged with the social sciences? <clears throat> will it uh, sort of atrophy? I, I'm very encouraged about the uh, future of um, business ethics, especially from the point of view of, of business ethics uh, research and the quality of the people who have entered into this field and the work that they are uh, doing. So as I said before, business ethics is now a very mature area. Um, but as it has matured, it's gotten away from its beginnings in uh, philosophy. So I described my own background, and that's the same background as uh, many of the other people who are the pioneers in this uh, series. Uh, we got PhDs in philosophies, we worked into contemporary moral problems and moved into business ethics and the like. That was a very good career path for those of us of that uh, age group. But that's ancient history. That's not happening, hasn't happened for a long time. <laughs> uh, and I I'm concerned about where f future PhDs in business ethics are going to come from. And one place they're not going to come from, I believe, is uh, philosophy. Uh, so again, that's uh, ancient history, and it's not going to be uh, repeated. But I am encouraged by the way in which uh, PhDs, especially from business schools, uh, are showing an interest in uh, ethical issues. And so we're not going to have PhDs uh, in ethics entering business schools. But what we are going to have is PhDs in uh, marketing, management, finance, and other areas who have, have a research interest in business ethics and will contribute to that uh, field. So I think that the the interdisciplinary aspect of uh, the people who are now entering the field is a great strength and will, continue, and will enable continued research in, in uh, business ethics. Where I'm more pessimistic is about the uh, role of business ethics in the curriculum. Uh, I don't think we really developed the model for how uh, ethics should be taught in, for example, in the undergraduate business ethics programs or in the MBA uh, programs. They're handled in all kinds of different uh, ways. 
And I don't really see a real commitment on the part of uh, our major business schools uh, to work business ethics into the curriculum. So we have the people who are very capable of doing high quality research in business ethics. And we have some people who can teach such courses. What we don't have is the, that, so to speak, the uh, conceptualization of what a course in business ethics in a business ethics program should be. You all have you have you have one. So I have a question, John, and I mm. think because of your work in finance and obviously mm. other spaces, mm. but in finance in particular, you have the ability to think about the impact of your work on corporations. Talk to us about what impact you think your work may have had on corporations, either because you know that it's happened, you see that it's happened, or you've had students mm. that have helped make it happen. I think the impact that uh, business ethics research and business ethics education can have upon business is very indirect through the students that we uh, create. Um, I, so, I, so I find business ethics very different, say, from medical ethics, where medical ethics is now very well established as a part of uh, medical practice, the administration of hospitals and the like, where ethicists uh, rub shoulders with doctors and others in handling very specific uh, cases. So we don't find, and I don't, would, would not expect to find, business ethicists in corporate boardrooms uh, uh, giving advice as to how to uh, uh, deal with ethical issues. I think the impact is, A, on the students that we create, uh, but, but insofar as most of the issues, again, are not matters of individual conduct but of uh, institutions and markets. I think w the impact is going to be what uh, business ethicists themselves can contribute along with a variety of other disciplines as we try to tackle some of the major problems in uh, business ethics. I'll just give one example. Uh, there's a lot of concern right now with uh, high frequency trading. I've written on it and I've uh, uh, reviewed a number of papers for publication in academic journals on this uh, issue. And these papers will be read. And uh, moreover, in my own writing and that of others, uh, we've drawn upon work done, again, by the Federal Reserve Bank and by Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, FINRA and others. Uh, so this issue is very much on, high on the list uh, for the major actors in developing financial regulation. So I think the main impact of people in business ethics is going to be to contribute in whatever way they can to research projects uh, that are already underway in dealing with these kinds of issues. And, and do you see any other, other places of research where we're not doing enough in business ethics? Or, mm. well, we cover a lot of ground. Right. right. Well, one impression I have is that in doing business ethics, we are not isolated from the larger society. <laughs> and so I think that people do choose research topics and cover in their classes topics they consider to be of vital importance uh, today. Uh, but again, there are so many of these. <laughs> And the contribution that uh, any one individual can make is, is, is relatively minor. Um, I'm not particular, I don't feel there's any big area where uh, there's a pressing need for large numbers of people to rush in and try to, to, to do um, uh, research. As long as we keep trying to find uh, important research topics and make some a contribution, then I think we will. We have to recognize that when we talk about making business uh, more ethical, that this is a very big multifaceted project. And so um, I sort of follow out uh, Candide. If we just tend our own garden, <laughs> uh, then we will uh, make, make uh, progress. John, you have worked at two different universities, mm -hmm. at John Carroll and Loyola. And you talked a little bit about no consistency really yet in terms of how we teach this topic. What have you learned from your experiences at these two schools that might be helpful in establishing some sort of more common approach? Well, these are uh, the two schools I've taught at are, are both uh, Jesuit schools uh, and 
have to confess as a non-Catholic, I have found teaching in Jesuit schools to be very satisfying <laughs> because they do have a strong interest in, again, the area of, uh, of ethics and, uh, and values. And, and today's probably the firmest hold of business ethics in the curriculum is in Catholic, especially Jesuit uh, schools. And but this is not something I think can be readily transferred to other institutions. But I think the key is, in some way, identifying ethics as something valuable to pursue. Uh, and quite frankly, I think the Jesuit schools and Catholic schools in general uh, are concerned about their brand and find ethics to contribute to their brand. But I don't think most other schools find that ethics can contribute that much to their uh, brand. But there again, there have been a few schools, especially the Darden School, the University of Virginia, uh, Horton School, the University of Pennsylvania, to some extent uh, uh, Harvard, uh, who have uh, made this move. And so I, I think that, uh, first of all, the treatment of ethics in the curriculum as opposed to research is going to be still be a, a highly varied fabric <laughs> with schools doing it in very different uh, ways. I don't think that's necessarily bad. Uh, there's not one model that um, fits all. But it would certainly be helpful if uh, more schools would uh, recognize business ethics, especially business ethics, as something that uh, can contribute to their uh, brand. So I, I expect business ethics in the future to be, again, rather spotty, strong at some schools and almost neglected at uh, others. Do you think the accreditation process for business schools <coughs> will have any impact? Yes, I think that probably has the greatest impact. <laughs> and so I think a great deal depends on the position of the AACSB and the extent to which they make, uh, they now say something like dealing with uh, ethical and social issues it must be dealt with some way in the curriculum. But this is a very vague statement with very uneven uh, uh, enforcement. And uh, my sense is that the AACSB has become less serious in recent years about uh, making that a criterion for um, accreditation. So if we could somehow um, uh, approach the ACSB and persuade them <laughs> to take ethics uh, much more seriously as a part of the curriculum, then that would have a tremendous impact. Can I ask a question? Does the financial sector, does it pose a different set of ethical challenges compared to the other corporate sector? Um, well, one thing that's unique about them is there's certainly a lot of money to be made. So the incentives are much more uh, powerful. On the other hand, um, in terms of regulation, the financial industry generally is one of the most regulated aspects of the American, indeed, the world uh, economy. <laughs> so issues such as I raised earlier about high-frequency trading are going to be recognized, are going to be addressed, and probably in the end in a very effective way. Uh, way. So um, one challenge in teaching, in dealing with uh, finance ethics, is it is so heavily regulated. <clears throat> and one reason I think that major financial institutions, such as uh, banks, have uh, seemingly shown so little interest in ethics is they have very big compliance departments. <laughs> so they deal with these issues very, in most cases, very effectively, but largely through the lens of compliance rather than uh, ethics. Uh, so I think that uh, shows that they are dealing with these issues probably more directly and more effectively than standard uh, corporations. But uh, because of the, uh, again, strong incentives involved, because of the he heavy financial uh, uh, penalties, <laughs> they have to take these issues very, very seriously and deal with them effectively. Do you ever think that compliance is a very charged word? Hmm. Uh, that yeah. their natural state is not to want to do these things? No, I think that, uh, well, particularly financial institutions have very large compliance departments, <clears throat> and they are very active. But again, they're active almost entirely with regard to individual conduct. So to get back to a point that I made earlier, uh, insofar as business is regulated through compliance, it regulates largely individual uh, conduct. <clears throat> but uh, insofar as the need is for changes in markets, institutional structures, and the like, <clears throat> that can only come from the regulatory structure. 
But again, as I said, uh, you know, Federal Reserve Bank, uh, SEC, uh, FINRA, and others are very much active in this uh, area. So again, I think we have two levels of regulation. <laughs> One level is compliance departments within banks that are concerned primarily with individual conduct. And then the structure of our financial institutions and financial markets, which is really much more a job for government. John, did you come here to tell us anything else that we haven't had a chance to ask you? <clears throat> um, what else would I want to add? Um, yeah, I think I probably covered most of it, so. If there's anything else that comes to your mind, this is the time. Yeah. What other questions do you have? I, I think we've covered a lot of the questions. I think mm -hmm. you're, yeah, I, I really think we've, we've uh, oh, I, I know, and one other thing, do you see business ethics as a profession? I mean, do you see business as a profession, or business ethics as a profession? There's been this talk, you know, about making managers professional mm -hmm. uh, in some of the literature, and I don't know what, what, are, what is your view of that? Well, I've argued in print that uh, that finance is not a <coughs> profession, and except very limited exceptions, such as, for example, financial advisors, <laughs> yes. I don't think they really fit the criteria for a profession, and I'm not sure what is gained by trying to emphasize prof uh, professionalism in uh, business. I think the idea is to have managers be not only aware of, of ethical issues, but then have a Agency that mm. will, which is with, with the American Medical Association, mm. which will uh, condemn actually and, and sometimes disbar right. or take away their licenses of, 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 right. of law <clears throat> professors. Well, medicine is a profession itself, and there are criteria for a profession which you find in yeah. books on professional ethics. Okay. And so I don't, I won't, don't, won't get hung up on formal definitions, but I just don't see, for the most part, the practice of management or any other job in business as being itself a profession. Again, possibly with the exception of accountants. Yes, who are professionals. Right, who are professionals. And they have a, a different accrediting agency. Right. So but I think the main question is, what is the, if we want to uh, produce um, managers and again we're obviously putting all this emphasis just on managers the corporations have lots and lots of employees <laughs> so I think we need to think broader in terms of all those who are part of a <coughs> corporation and we want to uh, facilitate uh, ethical conduct and what is the best means for uh, doing that and so uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, trying to speak of professionalization is the best way to accomplish that. Uh, one way to accomplish it is, again, we can, uh, in terms of my uh, relationship to, with uh, stakeholder theory, <laughs> I have often said to students, uh, if we have a problem, let's say, with managers filing false uh, expense reports, we can do one of two things. One, we can give lectures on ethical conduct and uh, uh, the importance of filing accurate um, uh, expense statements and the like, or we can just hire more auditors. And just fire. well, I have penalties for um, violations. So in terms of uh, the emphasis, I argue again with my students: given a choice between changing people and changing systems, uh, go with systems every time. It's much easier than changing people. 